Um, so, I'll be um, talking about um, pollen analysis um, that we're developing. Um, sort of what we really want is a high throughput system that we can analyze loads of samples. Uh, I haven't done all of it myself, <coughs> other people are involved. Um, so why do you do pollen analysis? So our interest is really um, pollination ecology. We're working with foraging strategies, habitat use, movement, competition, plant pollinator um, interactions, and all of those things. And, and that's, that's a relatively uh, big and vibrant field. Um, then there's also many other fields, so in paleobotany, um, aerobiology, medicine, forensics, and not to uh, shouldn't forget melissopalynology. Maybe many of you don't know melissopalynology. It's the science of honey quality. Um, so, and there too, uh, they use pollen analysis. So, so um, clearly, pollen analysis is something people have been doing uh, for a long time. But you typically rely on sitting in a microscope, um, doing this very manually. Um, and there are um, rather intimidating um, German dichotomous keys and stuff, you know, um, where you can where you can actually. Um, identify your pollen quite well, um, down to various kind of groups at least, if not species. Uh, but because it's so time consuming, what people typically do is they collect a few samples and then they subsample them. So a few pollen from a few samples is usually what pollen people have been doing in pollination ecology and we want to be able to, to scale that up a lot. Um, so that's really it. Uh, high throughput system, that's what we want. Um, the methods we're using are sort of standard to this audience. Um, so um, one thing that's not standard, and I guess I have to apologize here, is that I'm not using Python. <laughs> um, and that's just because you speak the languages you're fluent in, right? Um, I happen to be fluent in MATLAB, and that's um, MATLAB is really actually quite strong in image analysis. Um, it has a good deep learning toolbox and so on. So that's what I did, and, and now I, that's what I have. Um, we're mostly just using ResNet 18. We've been trying other networks too. ResNet 18 is good enough um, for what we're doing. Um, and this is the workflow. So um, for building up, a reference library. So that's the first thing. You need to have your training images. Um, and in our case, setting up the reference library started with somebody doing that for her own uh, manual analysis. Um, Anna Parson did that. Um, we've been scanning those. Um, so it works like we pick a reference sample from flower, directly from flower, we know the identity of that flower. Put that, prepare a microscope slide uh, of that, have a little cube of fuchsine um, gel that stains the pollen, uh, or melt it on the, on the slide. Load five slides a time in a scanner, not a flatbed scanner, Eric, but uh, uh, <coughs> a, a slide scanner typically used for pathology samples. So they're really made to uh, scan sort of thin slices of um, yeah um, of things rather than um, an open sample with just little dots in them, uh, but it does work really well. It's basically a microscope with a cabinet on it. Um, scans at 0 0.25 microns. Um, you can scan many Z layers if you want. We scan in five. Then we need to stack those into one single image, or we could do something fancy, you could create 3D images, uh, but we don't really find any need for that. Um, relatively quick to do. Um, stacking takes a little bit of time, but not for us, only for the computer. Um, then what we do is we don't use um, uh, CNN, but just classic image segmentation, basically. And out we get all these, um, 
all the objects with no points in here. Oh, anyway, we get the pollen plus whatever garbage there is um, in these. And then we just need to basically um, say which of these pollen are actually um, the correct one. So, so this is actually the annotation and labeling we do. We need obviously to, to label the slide well. Um, Um, so basically, we have a we have a built little web interface where we then really quickly just click through the ones that are correct, send them to um, the file system, a folder for each species, and that sort of the database we have. Um, and at the moment, we're at something like 500 um, plant species. For each of these, we have usually more than one, um, sometimes up to 10 samples, and one sample comes from one flower. Um, and at least 250 species, we have more than two samples, or two samples and more. And altogether, um, very many pollen grains. So from each sample, we pick out a couple of hundred, up to a thousand grains. So, um, oops, yeah, that was... There we go. Yeah, it actually was that. So this is how the scanned image looked. They're really big, um, like 25 by 25,000 pixels. Um, we just use, you know, standard classic image segmentation. Basically, what Luca was was mentioning before are those techniques that have been around for a long time. They work really well because we have rather clean images, um, so we don't need. Um, AI models to, to segment the images. Um, and then we sort of use all the objects we find, both when we create the libraries and when we run it through the models to then classify samples. Um, and what we need to bear in mind is that, um, so from the same Within the species, there's some variation, obviously, like always. So, so making sure we have many samples per species is important. And sometimes, you know, just the staining looks a little bit different, and that's definitely uh, the kind of information that the AI model will pick up. Um, so, uh, we need more than a single sample per species, um, um, as many as we can, basically, but. Three or more seems to be good. Five is good, 10 is perfect. Um, and so basically when we're analyzing the data, when we're classifying, we do the same thing, but then we collect typically the pollen samples from a bumblebee, we steal their workload when they come back to the hive, or something we take it from them. Um, make a microscope slide, scan it, stack it, segment it, and then we classify. Um, each sample can have something like, you know, from a few pollen grains sometimes, but so up to 15,000 in one slide. And for each one of them, we'll get then the, like a vector of probabilities that it belongs to each species and so on. Um, which means that we can play with, like the rest of you, but we can play with, um, entropy of classification and all, all these kind of things, which, which is um, sort of nice to be able to do. Um, overall accuracy is good. Um, and, and, well, if we, if we do sort of just a standard um, classification of uh, not used training samples, we get, you know, 98, 99% like everybody else. Uh, but when we do out of domain classification somewhere between 70-90% uh, for different species, roughly 85, um, assuming that humans are correct, um, which they're not, uh, so we don't really know, but, but it's, it's good, it's good enough. 
Um, and for anything that's common in the samples, it's usually quite high. Uh, you'll always get some rare um, uh, classifications, and some of them will be misidentifications. We can do um, augmentation if and when we need. We Especially when, I mean, when we have samples like this, there's no need to do augmentation, really. We have many training samples, and they have all the variation. Um, but if we have murky samples, like they sometimes can be, then what we can do is, is replacing the background of the training, training images with something that has more rubbish in it. Um, and that sort of pushes down entropy at least a bit. Obviously, needless to say, um, it's really important to make sure that the model knows all the species or all the classes that you have in your sample, because otherwise it's going to guess for something else. It will be guessing for something you have trained it on, um, obviously. Um, and so um, not teaching it everything it should know will just confuse it. One thing we've been playing with is that we want to know how similar are different species. So here we have two different species of maple, um, two species from the Brassica family, um, two um, Asterasa, um, common dandelion, uh, for example. Um, they are more similar to each other than unrelated species. Um, how much more similar. So what we did was basically we had all our, in this case, roughly 250 species, trained the model on 249 of them. So in the first case, on all species except Arsa campestra. Then we took our Arsa campestra set, uh, pollen and threw back to that model and said, how do you classify these? And many of them will be to the other Acer species. Um, and then you see how similar, basically, how similar do you think that is. So um, those probability basically make, give us a, a um, correlation matrix of sorts. Um, and we can create a nice um, dendrogram like this. Each family is um, indicated by a different color, but some of the colors actually um, are rotated. And you can see many of, many of the families actually align really well together and even down to genera and so on. Sometimes they do not. Uh, some big families are you know, a little bit all over the place. And that's because morphology um, varies across in, in funny ways. Um, which I think, I mean, that, that's an interesting research field in its own, and I'm, 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 that's not my expertise. Um, so, for example, Asterasa um, looks like this, where we have, they group rather nicely in categories, and we can, we can you know, you would be able to see the difference between these categories. Um, and they follow quite nicely from that German book I showed you. They call something like 14.14 um, .14 or 17.10 or something like that, the classes are called. And, and these actually, they, they follow quite nicely. Um, so for the Asterasa, certainly, that's, that's clearly the case. Um, Brassicas is, is a little bit harder because they are all really similar across a large group. Uh, of species, and that's <coughs> sort of um, a bit of a problem because um, orange grape, for example, is an important crop that pollinators visit, and we're interested in what does that mean to the pollinator community having those fields of mass flowering crops, and it's it's hard for us to separate that. Also, which is sort of just curious fact, is that. Salisasa, so willow trees, for example, um, they're actually really quite similar to the brassicas, and they're not, as far as I know, they're not closely related at all. So, how is that? Anyway, so we're more or less in production mode now. Now we have a, 
um, run quite a few projects, a couple of papers published, um, master's student thesis and so on. Um, usually we, we do somewhere between 100 and 3,000 uh, samples in a project. On average, maybe 1,000 pollen grains per, per sample. So it's, these are big masses of pollen grains. Um, we've done one, one project, or we have an ongoing going project, where we're comparing this model, our model, with metabar coding. Um, and the congruence is really good. Um, they, they identify basically the same thing. The metabar coding is usually able to go down to species, and we're often not. On the other hand, the metabar coding isn't, um, isn't quantitative, um, at least not to the same extent as this, and we are much cheaper. Uh, so I think that, that can be an argument. Um, what we're about to do is release this kind of library where, where you can go in and just look at how do the pollen look for different species. Um, we won't yet be able to sort of release the library for with all the training data so anybody could use it. Um, and mostly just because it's a lot of data and um, that uh, somebody, we need to curate that, we need to build a a different infrastructure than we have, but that's something I'd, I'd like to do down the line. But at least for people who are interested in, in sort of learning pollen manually, um, this can be quite helpful. Um, and we're really happy to collaborate. If you if you already have your own scanner, <coughs> so you could um, create your, your scanned slides, then we can collaborate online because training the data, sending a trained model and so on, that's, that's quite easy. Um, and we're often having guests from other places come in and using the lab. Um, so that's also possible. Um, yeah, I guess I've already said most of this. Um, I think we, we still, I mean, we already have a good accuracy. I think we'd be interested in getting, improving that, getting down to the species level as much as we possibly can. Uh, and there might be different avenues of doing that. Um, um, yeah, we're doing a, a, we're on a high throughput system, or that's what we have. Basic, somebody who's, who's good at it can, can process up to 100 slides a day, um, which, is, which is pretty good. If you do it manually, you count fewer and you process maybe four a day. So it's, it's a big difference in, in labor cost. Um, 